Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tim Gray. I'm the Executive Director of Environmental Defense, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the third episode of our recovery series today, The New Battle in Single-Use Plastics. In this series overall, we're uh, digging deep uh, and answering your most pressing questions on current environmental issues and looking at what solutions can pivot Canada towards a greener, healthier, and more resilient economy that puts people on the planet first as we come out of this uh, COVID pandemic. If you don't know us, uh, Environmental Defence is a leading Canadian advocacy organization that works with government, industry, and individuals to defend clean water, a safe climate, and healthy communities. Uh, a little bit outside of the city today, I'm uh, up uh, north of Toronto, and I just wanted to um, provide an acknowledgement of the land where I am today and, and talk a little bit about um, the fact that we should do that everywhere. So I would like to acknowledge that I'm here on the traditional ancestral and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabeg, here on Wendat and Algonquin peoples, who are the rightful title holders and stewards of this land, and that Bancroft is covered by the Williams Treaty. Today, we are calling in from different locations, and I encourage all of us who are non-Indigenous to recognize and learn about those whose land they're on today. As we start this uh, webinar, let's keep in mind that it is Indigenous peoples who are disproportionately impacted by pollution, climate change, and environmental justice. So today, we have two speakers with us, uh, Clarissa Morowski, who's the CEO of Reloop, um, and she is calling in uh, across the Atlantic from Spain, and uh, Ashley Wallace, who's the Plastics Program Manager at Environmental Defense. Welcome, Clarissa and Ashley. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So just before we get started today, I want to explain a bit how a bit about how we'll be using the webinar software today, because that can be a little bit confusing sometimes. At the bottom of your screen, you can see a button called Q&A. Just hit that button and type in your questions, and our team will be able to relay them to me uh, online. Uh, we get a large volume of requests in our previous webinars, so we won't get to them all, but we'll try and get to as many as we possibly can. And we're going to be recording the webinar as well and putting it on YouTube. So if you have to leave early or if you learn something you'd like to share with friends, family, colleagues, um, we'll be sending it around afterwards so you can uh, have a quick look at that. So let's dive into the topic that we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be uh, looking at the resurgence of single-use plastics during the COVID-19 crisis and also what we can do about plastics overall. So right now the plastics industry is using the pandemic to promote a, a, a pro-plastic agenda. Uh, but now more than ever, Canada needs to really go all in on reducing plastic in our environment and creating the jobs that uh, can occur by cleaning it up. So before the pandemic started, uh, many countries around the world were responding to public pressure to do something meaningful about the global plastic pollution crisis. Uh, we've seen these images from around the world, piles of plastic in oceans, landfills covering shorelines. Um, I'm sure uh, all of you in your communities have seen the same kind of thing, uh, especially this time of year in the spring in our lakes and rivers. In Canada alone, we have uh, 29,000 tons of plastic waste escape into the environment annually. Um, and it, there it harms wildlife and even human health. In uh, June of last year, so June 2019, the federal government announced that it plans to address plastic pollution in Canada, including the banning of certain single-use plastic items. So this was really good news. And they also talked about uh, more broadly addressing the plastic crisis. So not just banning some things, but actually looking to improve the overall waste management system. Some provinces have also introduced measures to reduce single-use plastics. Uh, for example, last year, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island both, both uh, instituted plastic bag bans, which was, was great to see. And uh, industry and retailers, retailers are also starting to make some changes. Uh, for example, you may have heard Sobeys eliminated plastic bags from their stores. Uh, some beverage producers, including Coca-Cola and Nestle, have committed to minimum recycled content targets for their bottles and Unilever and Procter and & Gamble and Nestle are, are looking at some refillable packaging for their products. So now all this progress we've made on single-use plastics uh, seems to be under threat. 
For example, uh, many Canadian grocery stores are currently not allowing customers to use re uh, usable bags. In the US, the plastic industry has lobbied to remove bans on single-use plastic bags, uh, citing hygiene concerns. And we saw bans actually lifted in Maine, New Hampshire, Oregon, and Massachusetts. In the European Union, the plastics industry lobbyists have asked the European Commission to postpone implementation of a single-use plastic directive that's intended to cut the pollution. Uh, fortunately there, however, the Commission has rejected this call. And in England, a ban on plastic straws, stirs, and cotton buds uh, that was due to be started in April has been postponed. The interesting thing in all this, of course, is that there's no evidence that single-use plastics are safer. New research has found that uh, the coronavirus can survive, survive on most surfaces, including plastic. As a matter of fact, the study found that the virus lived longest on all, on all surface types on plastics or for two or three days. And that's in comparison with cardboard, where it uh, survived for less than 24 hours, or in air, uh, where it survived for only three hours. So plastic pollution was a massive problem before the pandemic started, and it's still one now. So what are the solutions to this? Um, Clarissa is going to speak about the lessons learned from the European Union's single-use plastic directive, uh, which, is a, which is a mouthful, but also really important. And it's considered the best in class in the world. And we can look there about how solving the problem of plastic pollution can also help to re-kick re start our economy uh, after uh, we get over this viral pandemic, because there's a lot of jobs uh, in this space, and we'll hear a bit about that. And it's also really important that we not, that Canada as a country, not bend to the will of uh, wealthy and, and desperate plastics industry and, and the oil and gas industry that's behind it. And Ashley is going to walk us through uh, what Canada should be doing instead as kind of a, a growth from uh, what Clarissa talks about in terms of what's happening in the EU. So let's, uh, let's get started. Let's dive right into the topic we have today. And then uh, after we're, the two speakers, we're going to have time for a conversation, some questions. So first, I'm going to uh, introduce Clarissa Morosky. Clarissa is the co-founder and CEO of the Reloop platform. Uh, it's a European association that supports policy to further a circular economy. She brings over 25 years of technical, analytical, and communications experience in waste minimization policy. Today, she's going to discuss the, the EU's directive, what Canada can learn from it, and uh, what countries around the world can do to end plastic waste. So Clarissa, thanks so much for joining us and, and over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate being invited to this webinar. And uh, for your audience, just so you know, I am a Canadian, but I'm now residing in Europe and I've been doing a lot of work at the European Union level. So what I'd like to take you through is it's been an amazing four years um, in my entire career of about 25 years. I've never had so much policy activity occur and I'd like to take you a little bit through that journey and hopefully we can uh, learn some lessons from the European experience and apply them to Canada. So first of all, just for some background, the European Union are 27 countries comprising of about 450 million people, indicated here on the map. And it's effectively three branches of government, a little bit like America, I guess you could say. There's the big uh, parliament, which has about 750 parliamentarians from 27 countries, many languages, many parties. Then you have the council, which is one country has a seat on that council, so there's 28 seats. And then you have the European Commission. And the commission is really the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic engine of the entire EU. And it is through the commission that, uh, it's the commission that tables legislation, and it's commission that creates strategic direction to move forward, and then it just has to be ultimately negotiated by the Parliament and the Council, and you've got a law. So some background on the laws, they, the European Union uh, has always had some legislative um, laws in place on waste, and more recently, published in May of 2018, they updated those laws. And here's some key areas of interest in that they put a big cap on landfilling of 10% by 2035. Um, so that's intended to really stimulate more waste uh, diversion. They've also indicated that they are not really going to be financially supporting incineration or waste to energy as much moving into the future because it's not carbon friendly. Um, and there are far better things to do in terms of the three hours hierarchy. There's a larger 
target for recycling of 65% and on all household waste. And there's specific packaging targets um, which have increased significantly from the last version, in particular plastics at 55%. But along with that target is a new plastics, a new recycling calculation, which effectively moves the point of measurement. And what it basically means is that it's not about what you're collecting in terms of weight, but it's rather about what you're recycling in terms of weight. And I'll show you a photograph to illustrate that right here. Um, here's a ketchup bottle and where we're currently measuring in Canada and up until now in Europe is the weight of that plastic bottle full of ketchup. And that is the assumed amount of weight that has been recycled. So you can imagine that as we move to the right of the screen to the empty bottle, the one that's actually going into the recycling machine, those plastic numbers are going to go down. Those recycling rates are just going to drop. So getting to 55 on plastics is going to be that much harder. Um, and we're going to have to do that much more changing in the way we do things to get to that 55% number. Part of that change is financing. And that's where extended producer responsibility comes in, where we already have it across the European Union to pay for packaging, collection, and recovery. But now it's setting a base minimum of 50% financial contribution from producers. So at the very minimum, you'd have to do 50%. So countries like Poland and Hungary, they have like 10%. Even the UK had about 10% up until this. Well, actually UK is not part of EU, but those Eastern European countries are gonna really have to ramp up that EPR contribution and it's gonna hit brand owners really, really hard across Europe. After all of these legislative changes were made, and this is where it gets interesting, the European Union, the Commission, launched its plastic strategy. And I won't get into the details, it's pretty big, you can Google it, but effectively it has a whole series of measures that have to be undertaken to improve the plastics waste problem and to increase circularity of plastics across all products and not just packaging. Um, one of the things that has erupted, uh, I mean, that led to this is, of course, all these, you know, photographs that we see all the time with plastics in the environment and out of that plastic strategy and you see things like this as well where there was a brand audit that looked at the biggest um, contributors to litter and these were the names that came up obviously this is the, a lot of them are beverage brands so out of this came the single-use plastics directive and it was passed by this guy this is franz timmermans he was the second most powerful uh, person in the commission in the old administration and he's again the second most powerful person in the new administration and the head of the new green deal the single-use plastics directive was his baby and as you can see from the dates uh, down below it was introduced in may and it was actually in december a mere eight months later there was full agreement from both the parliament and the council that is a record in environmental policy making at the eu level and finally it was published last year in July. So the single use directive is firm, a law, there's no way they're going to um, retract it, there's, it's done. Right now we're in the implementation stage and putting some of the devils, the devil is in the details, so we're starting to get into how to implement it. But I can tell you that um, it was truly inspiring that this thing got through so quickly by a man who, when all this started, was pretty anti-circular economy, to be frank with you. So he in his, himself had an epiphany and it resulted in um, what could be a very positive legacy. So I'm gonna walk you through the, sing the single use plastics directive. Four key parts, short directive, pretty concise. The first one is product bans. So these are single use plastic products that will be banned by the marketplace, in, from the marketplace in 2021. The list is on the left. And these are of course all cotton blood, bud sticks that have plastic in them, cutlery uh, with, are made out of plastic, plates made out of plastic, straw stirs made out of plastic. The definition of plastics is in the law, and I won't go through it, it's quite technical, but I will say this, that it currently, as it's written, does scope out, out of scope, a number of items that are questionable in terms of whether or not they're plastic, and more particularly, whether or not they have the same type of impact on the environment and in the seas and in the oceans as plastics would. Um, those are still questionable. Our position is that we take a precautionary principle as we move forward. And if those particular types of plastics, PHAs, vis viscose, lyocell, want to be exempt from the plastics directive, then they have to come up with independent scientific evidence to show that indeed those materials are compatible with the natural environment. 
Oh, just to quickly, um, one of the things that was added at the end that didn't even come from the commission was extent, expanded polystyrene, so um, foam containers for uh, food containers. That was added by the Parliament. So what's so interesting about the single-use directive, not only did it go through fast, but they actually made it stronger when normally going through the process it would get watered down. So it actually got stronger in some ways, so that's quite interesting too. Number two, the key piece is extending extended producer responsibility legislation to cover products that aren't just packaging. So here we have things like wet wipes, balloons, um, tobacco filters, uh, lightweight carrier bags. All of these might not have been covered by the Packaging Packaging Waste Directive and not under an existing EPR program. So again, what this means is that producers, brand owners of these various products are going to have to contribute funds into an extended producer responsibility program at a national level that's going to finance the cost of collecting, transporting, treatment, which in many cases is garbage, um, as well as litter cleanup, which is of course a big question mark in terms of how much that's going to cost, and awareness raising. So this is a huge wake-up call for these brand owners. The third key uh, part of the legislation is Article 9, which stipulates a 77% and a 90% target uh, by years 2025 and 2029, respectively, for plastic beverage bottles up to and including, or up to three liters, but including the caps and the lids. And the law stipulates that they can, you can do it via deposit return program, um, which we see all over Canada, except in Ontario for non-alcohol containers, and or through an existing separate collection, like a blue box system where you've got, you know, bins on every street corner and you're just trying to collect as much as you possibly can. Um, we don't believe that you can get to 90% without a deposit return program, but ultimately the law is really more focused on outcomes and not telling member states how to get to 77 and 90%. As a result, uh, we have seen tremendous movement on deposit return programs in Europe. More specifically, these are the countries in dark green that had deposits and the countries in light green that are about to introduce deposits. So these are all legislative changes. This is only the first of um, more that will be added to the map, all uh, because of this new article. They're preparing for 90%. They're planning for 90%. And the final thing uh, is the fourth big thing out of the directive is a design requirement or a product requirement. And in this case, it, it's for beverage containers, plastic beverage containers, which basically says that the cap has to be tethered or attached to the product during its um, usage stage. So that's one example of a tethered cap. There's probably many. They'll come out with guidelines in the next kind of 18 months, I guess, uh, for producers so they can comply by 2024. The next one, which is a biggie, is recycled content for plastic bottles of 25% by 2025 and 30% for all plastic beverage bottles by 2030. Um, I don't maybe need to tell many of you on this webinar why recycled content is so critical, why that was put in there, why environmentalists fought for this tooth and nail, was because this is a simple chart. Um, all that you need to understand about this chart is look at the line dropping at a rapid rate. That is going from 0% recycled content in a plastic PET bottle all the way down to 100% recycled content. This is the carbon um, footprint per functional unit. You can see recycled content has a massive impact on the carbon footprint of any package, not just PET. But the line would even be more drastic for aluminum, for glass, still a line, maybe not as drastic, uh, for glass, not as drastic. So all of this um, really sends a message, um, I would say, to producers that they've got to start thinking in terms of recycled content, thinking of terms in terms of um, redesigning so that they can simplify the design if they're going to use plastics so that those plastics will be fully circular. So I'm going to stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions after you hear from Ashley. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carissa. That was that was great. And uh, we will dig in and into some of the details of that. I have some a bunch of questions that I jotted down and I'm sure our audience is going to uh, have a bunch as well. For those of you who are just joining us, we've just heard from Chris Samorowski, who's CEO of Reloop, 
Uh, Clarissa just gave us an overview of the EU's uh, single-use plastics directive and what Canada can learn from it when it comes to reducing plastic waste. And so now we're going to go over to uh, Ashley. And Ashley Wallace is Environmental Defense's Plastics Program Manager. Ashley holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology and a Master's in Environment and Sustainability, both from Western University in London. Since joining Environmental Defense, she has led our water program and now manages the campaign to end plastic pollution in Canada. So no small feat there, but I'm sure she's gonna get it done. Uh, Ashley's going to walk us through what Canada needs to be doing now to address plastic pollution and how moving towards a circular economy would benefit us all as well as the planet. So over to you, Ashley. Thanks, Tim. Um, and thanks, Clarissa, so much for your presentation. Um, so what is the situation here in Canada? Um, well, in Canada, we sadly only recycle about 9% of the plastic waste we generate. Um, about 86% currently goes to landfill, 4% is incinerated, and what remains um, is uh, left to the environment. Well, my computer is doing a weird thing where it doesn't want to advance. One sec, guys. Okay, hopefully this continues to work. Um, so one of the largest contributors to plastic waste in Canada is single-use plastic, especially packaging. Um, most packaging is used for less than six months, but it will spend decades, if not centuries, in the landfill. So it's incredibly important that Canada um, look at efforts to reduce plastic waste from single-use plastics and packaging in um, the policy decisions it makes in the future. As both Clarissa and Tim have mentioned, we know that plastics harm wildlife. I'm sure that many of us have seen pictures of whales with bellies full of plastic bags, um, or that really upsetting video of a sea turtle with uh, a straw in its nose. But plastics also contribute to climate change. Um, currently, about 99% of plastics are made from petrochemicals, which are derived from oil and gas, um, and plastic production accounts for about 12% of global oil demand. It's actually expected that that's only going to increase, um, especially as the oil and gas sector looks for new markets for their um, fossil fuels, um, as we transition toward, away from fossil fuels for the purposes of energy. Uh, and the story isn't that much better for the economy. Um, from an economic perspective, you can see here our current uh, system, so it's fairly linear. You have oil entering the system, it's uh, made into goods, we use those goods, and then when we're done with them, we dispose of them either into the landfill, through burning, or into the environment, with only a very small amount being turned into new high-value goods. It's estimated that Canadians actually throw away about $7.8 billion worth of plastic every year. Now if we compare this to a uh, circular economy, here instead of disposing of plastic waste at the end of uh, its life, you use that plastic to manufacture new goods. Um, so not only are you reducing your reliance on virgin oil, you're also essentially eliminating waste. And beyond the environmental benefits, there are huge economic benefits as well. So this is um, a, a chart from a study that was done for Environment and Climate Change Canada last year. Um, they looked at two models, one which was business as usual, we just keep doing what we're doing, um, and another one where Canada achieves a 90% diversion rate for plastics uh, by 2030. And they found that there would be significant reductions in annual waste management costs um, and also the creation of 42,000 extra jobs, which is fantastic. So how do we get there? This sounds amazing. Um, in March of this year, Environmental Defense released a report where we outline um, a number of things that we think that the Canadian government could do in the short term to help get us on the right track. I'm going to highlight a couple of them today, a few of them. So the first one, banning unnecessary uh, and hard to recycle plastics. <clears throat> 
So as Tim already mentioned, the Canadian government has already made a commitment to reduce or uh, to ban some single-use plastics. We think that that's a great first step. Um, items that they should be considering are the same ones that Clarissa went through in the EU plastics directive, things like uh, plastics cutlery, plastic bags, um, plastic straws, and that sort of thing. Uh, but we can't stop at bans alone. That's not going to get us where we want to go. Other things that the Canadian government should do, um, consider expanding and consolidating the use of deposit return programs. So uh, deposit systems increase collection and recycling rates. They also lead to higher value recycled material, which is incredibly important if we're going to hit recycled content targets. Um, but perhaps equally importantly, deposit return systems enable uh, more easy reuse. And so if we want to shift away from kind of this disposable, uh, take, make, use, dispose system and be using things longer reusing them um, deposit return programs are going to be a key feature um, and here's kind of actually an example of that uh, we think that the Canadian government should be working to support innovation and a shift towards reusable products and packaging um, so here is an example this is LATAS LATAS is a Canadian initiative um, it's popular in Quebec and basically the way it works you go to a cafe you buy a coffee you spend an extra five dollars if you want to take it to go and you get a mug but then when you're done with your coffee, you can return that mug um, at the same coffee shop or another participating coffee shop and get your $5 back. Um, I think a lot of us, when we think about reusable containers and reusable programs, we mostly think about bring your own container programs where you bring your own mug or your own container for home, from home. But systems like this allow for a broader um, uptake of reusable packaging. Um, the Canadian government can also uh, support schemes that discourage consumers from using disposable plastics. Um, we know that fees are very effective at this. Uh, years before Loblaw instituted its five cent uh, bag fee for disposable plastic bags, they did some research um, comparing providing an incentive like a small discount to consumers who brought their own bags versus charging them for the bags. Um, the incentive did essentially nothing but charging five cents for bags reduced uh, disposable bag use by 55%. And finally, um, the government needs to set aggressive recycled content targets um, for all of the reasons that Clarissa already explained in her presentation. Um, we think that Canada should be setting a recycled content target at least as strong as the EU. Um, but unlike the EU, which is focused specifically on beverage containers and recycled content targets for them, we think that Canada should be looking at recycled content targets across a variety of plastic uh, goods and plastic packaging. Uh, so that was a very brief overview of a lot of information that's in our report. Uh, if you're curious to learn more, I would encourage you to check it out. You can find it on our website at environmentaldefense.ca slash no time to waste report. Thanks so much, Ashley. That was great. Um, I just want to make sure folks know where we're at in our discussion today. So we've just heard from Clarissa and Ashley, and I have a couple of questions that I'm just going to start some start off with and then we're getting some coming in from the audience too that I want to make sure that we cover. Um, one of the key aspects of addressing waste, whether it be in Europe or in Canada, is this uh, notion of extended producer responsibility, which sounds kind of complicated, um, but it essentially means that, that people who are producing plastic have some financial obligation, either complete obligation or, or partial obligation for paying for it. Why is that such a key component of uh, dealing with the, the packaging and plastic crises? Why can't uh, we just continue with the mechanism we have now where municipalities or provinces or states or federal governments pay for collecting and recycling the waste? Why does it make more sense to have the producers do it? Maybe, um, Chris, maybe you could start just because this is so advanced in, a, um, in the European Union and, and uh, maybe Ashley, if you have anything to add, you could go ahead too. Yes, yeah, so EPR or extended producer responsibility is effectively shifting that burden of end of life management of products and packaging from what is now the general taxpayer and in the case of municipal waste management, the municipal taxpayer to the producers and those that profit from selling that product or package. Um, it's something that sort of started in the 80s in Europe um, and it's become a foundational piece of waste law now. Um, because at the very least, 
it offers financial resources to get the job done that municipalities often don't have. Large potential money to invest in capital, facilities, sorting facilities, trucks, etc. And the more, the broader, bigger vision of extended producer responsibility. The second goal is to somehow um, send a signal by getting producers to internalize those what were external costs, so they rethink how they design packaging, what materials they use, so that ultimately it's cheaper for them to manage it in the future. That's the broader, big, bigger goal that we're all seeking. Has EPR achieved those goals? Uh, the first one for sure, it's definitely um, saved municipalities money because now they can pass that cost on, um, but it hasn't necessarily translated into a major fundamental design shift. My personal position, is as soon as we give them 100% responsibility, full responsibility with standards and targets, high standards and targets, that's when you're gonna see that real innovation occur with the producers. So I don't know if you feel the same way, Ashley. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, some of the challenges we've seen with the way EPR has rolled out in the jurisdictions where it does exist um, is a lack of enforcement of targets. So targets are set, but at the end of the day, if producers don't meet them, there's nothing that's really holding them accountable. So um, that'll be a key piece of any EPR legislation that we see. Um, and I mean, I'm still hopeful in terms of the comparison to other existing models we have, like where municipalities continue to pay for waste management. I mean, that just doesn't really work. There's too much of a disconnect and you have producers constantly producing more complicated packaging um, that's incredibly hard to recycle, that doesn't get them a lot of money back for the resources it takes for them to recycle and the economics are just, they're just totally screwed. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think that EPR is gonna be an important piece of plastics policy moving forward. Right. Um, Chris, you know, one of the, the challenges we face here on trying to bring in a deposit return program in Ontario, and as you mentioned, uh, Ontario doesn't have one for plastic bottles, um, is very strong opposition by the bottling industry. So Nestle, Coca-Cola, you know, Unilever, all the major producers have really fought us hard to make sure that such a thing never gets adopted here. Um, what's the situation in Europe and do you get that kind of resistance from the, the major producers there or things change for some reason? So the situation in Europe was exactly uh, the same. It was. Uh, you had incredible opposition, grocers, bottlers, waste management sector because they wanted to protect their territory. Um, but it's actually all changing now, and it's changing because of the single-use plastics directive. Because for the first time, producers are going, and this is the key. I told you about the four things. Um, for beverage containers, there's a target, and there's a recycled content target. Now producers, the Cokes, the Denons, the Nestles, are going to have to find material that is recycled resin that they can put in their bottles so that they can achieve about 25% by law. As a global, globally speaking, all these companies have made pledges for even higher content amounts. Um, I don't have them off the top of my head, but you just need to do a Google search recycled content Coke and you'll see, I don't know, 50, 100, I don't know, Nestle. They've all made big promises. There's now more and more potential laws coming down the pipe. This is now a new business operating principle for them. So they absolutely have to secure material for their packaging. Plastics is the cheapest packaging. They are realizing that they won't even be able to use plastics if they don't solve the situation. So we have a situation where, I, you know, I've been in this business for 25 years. I've never seen so much drastic change. The very guys that were fighting deposits are now saying, we want to learn more. We want to go on field trips to Europe and visit them and see how they operate it. We want to talk to the experts. We want to have our consultants to do real proper economic studies on it. Uh, we want to design best in class principles, which you can get the Nestle ones, you can get the Coke ones, and they all, they're all good actually. They all basically make business sense. Um, so that's why we're seeing the change. I have no doubt that you're going to see the same changes occur in Canada because the reality is that it's a much more efficient way to operate when you've got all this packaging that you're putting out there. Why wouldn't you want to get it back and benefit from all that economic savings? Keep it clean, get as much as you can back and basically recirculate it, whether you're talking about reuse on one hand or where you're talking about high levels of recycled content on the other. So get ready for it. There's going to be a change. Well, I'm glad to hear that because uh, you know, we've, we've had such huge resistance. and It's the major reason why we haven't had movement in Ontario, I think. 
And uh, it's, it's good to hear that uh, some of that is likely to be changing. Just one more for me, and then we're gonna go to the audience for uh, questions. Um, for you, Ashley, you know, one of the things that uh, is offered as a solution to the plastics problem is um, biodegradable uh, materials, biodegradable disposables. Uh, what are some of the concerns around that? And, uh, you know, because I know that on a few of these products, like uh, the single use coffee pods, et cetera, that are supposed to be you know, uh, biodegradable, like we've, you know, been opposing their use. What, what are some of the issues associated with biodegradable plastic? Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, first off is that not every municipality even has municipal organic waste collection, which is what these items are supposedly designed for. Um, and then the municipalities that do have uh, curbside organic waste collection, often their systems are not actually able to compost these compostable materials or at least within the time frame that their facilities operate. So imagine you have a load of stuff going to the compost facility and it has banana peels and carrot peels and it also has these coffee pods in it. Well your banana peels and carrot peels are going to break down a lot faster and you're still going to have residual bits of the coffee pot in there. Um, so that's been a huge issue. Another issue is that some uh, especially biodegradable plastics as opposed to compostable, degra compostable plastics um, look a lot like regular plastics and people make the um, mistake of putting them into their blue bins. And when compostable materials or biodegradable materials end up in the blue bin, they actually contaminate the, recycled, the recyclables there and lead to lower quality recycled content. Because remember that these are not the same materials um, as like a PET plastic beverage bottle. If it's being made from a compostable plastic, it may not be the same kind of plastic it cannot turn into another new plastic bottle. Um, and then there's oxo-degradable plastics. And this is basically just a way of making it easier for plastics to break down. But that's just breaking down into smaller pieces like microplastics and plastic fragments. Um, and that's incredibly problematic because once those little bits of plastic get into the environment, they're incredibly hard to get back and capture. Um, and we're seeing more and more research come out about the amount of plastic that we're ingesting. Um, and that's only going to continue if we use plastics that we're encouraging to fragment more easily. Great, thanks a lot. I think that really helps. You know, I think it, it, the contamination issue and and the and the determination of biodegradability, I think, is really key, and uh, that's why I think that uh, you know we've had a lot of problems with them. Uh, some questions from the audience here. Uh, one from Melissa: Is there any talk of delaying or changing the Canada single-use plastic ban that's supposed to start in 2021, so next year, as a COVID impacts? Um, Ashley, have you heard anything about that? Um, I have not. My understanding is that they're still trekking along. Um, we were beginning to hear rumblings of them uh, proposing that plastics were uh, SEPA toxic or toxic under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act um, around the time of the pandemic and that announcement has been delayed. Uh, but there's still a lot of desire in the federal government to see action on plastics and I think that the Canadian public is still expecting the Canadian government um, to move ahead with regulation. Great, that's good news. Question from Adrian. What about products or packaging made with multiple layers of different kinds of materials? Uh, how's the EU dealing with those? Uh, so that's for Clarissa and you know how, what should we do about that in Canada as we move forward with a solution? Yeah, so that's obviously really problematic. Um, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say they're not recyclable. Um, you know, there's always a technical way to do it, but uh, just because it's technically possible it doesn't necessarily mean there's any capacity at a global level to do it so what the eu has is an instrument which falls in its packaging and packaging waste directive which actually gets is constantly kind of updated but uh, one of the parts is called the essential requirements and it's a part of the law that says if you want to sell packaging in the european union it has to meet certain criteria and they are revising those as we speak and they're going to hopefully make them as rigorous as possible to say things like um, I mean I'm not quite sure what it's going to say but it could literally phase out certain products demand recycled content in others um, we're going to wait and see what it says there is something called the single market in Europe so it makes it a little bit difficult to be too aggressive on prescriptive 
requirements at an EU level, um, but we're hoping it'll be as aggressive as possible. One thing is sure though, that there is a target that all packaging must be recyclable by 2030. So if a multi-layer package is not, then it's technically won't be allowed to be on the market. I will say that all those companies that make multi-layering, that whole plastics industry, are busy, busy working on innovative, lightweight, pouch-type, mono, mono, mono plastic, one plastic pouch material, um, because that would simplify things a lot. And um, there is always a benefit to lower weight. I mean, you can't deny those echo benefits, but if you can't recycle them, then it's kind of not really meaning, meaningful. So I think that we're gonna see some change in the next, we're gonna see some words on paper in terms of how they need to change and by when in the next probably 10 months. Great. Great, it's good to hear. Um, another question here from S. Atkinson, uh, and this is an issue that uh, I know is is both one that's being addressed in Europe, and you know we're, we're uh, having to address it here. It says, "What's your take on trying to recover energy from waste, even though it may not be the best option? Would it help to alleviate the amount of plastic going to landfills? So, should we be?" burning plastic or waste instead of putting it to landfills and you know is that the right question i guess <laughs> so maybe so, uh, Carissa, from the european perspective and then ashley uh so if you look at it from a scientific perspective plastics in a landfill doesn't really have any major climactic impacts um, if it's a secure landfill it'll just sit there for a long time if you put plastics in an incinerator you get serious emissions coming out of the stack not carbon friendly at all. So I would say uh, if you're looking at it from a carbon agenda, definitely we don't want to burn plastics. Um, there are a whole pile of plastics, specifically packaging, but even things like toys, where they're you know, high quality polypropylene, all they need is they need to be collected and they need to be sorted. Uh, we have unbelievable technology that we can, it's called near infrared sorting technology. There's about five companies globally that do it. It's like magic. You can sort plastics by polymer type, by color type, by shape type. You, we can actually sort a lot of plastics. If we could sort them and they're fairly clean stream, we can recycle them. So all efforts need to go in that direction. And I'll tell you that from a European perspective, even though everyone thinks that Europe is so incineration uh, crazy, the communication and the trending is to move away from energy from waste entirely and already now there's several examples of the european investment bank denying loans for um capital investment of waste incinerators so um the science is clear it is so against our climate change agenda that it's really not something that people feel it's worthy of investing in we need to invest in more collection and more sorting Right, of course, you know, we, we miss all the, the uh, technological opportunities and job opportunities as well, just when we just burn all this stuff. Um, Ashley, for you, uh, from Jeremy, why is black plastic so difficult to recycle? Okay, so there are some jurisdictions that do recycle black uh, plastic, but um, some of the main issues are it's actually quite hard to sort using technology because it blends in with the conveyor belts. So if you have black plastic on top of the conveyor belts, it might not be able to be picked out and then actually um, put into its correct bin. So it just kind of makes it through the entire recycling system and is then landfilled. Um, another issue with it is that uh, it's kind of low value. So if you think about having high, uh, clear or, or white plastics, they can more easily be turned into other plastic goods because they're not black. You can turn them into other uh, clear or green or blue or other plastic materials. But if something's black, it's, you can't really make it lighter. You can't make it less opaque. Um, so it's just pretty low value and the economics don't back up recycling it. Great, thanks. If I, could, if I could just add something, um, you know, it's the black issue is, a, is, a, is an issue, but if we could just get the producers to use like three colors in all the packaging that we see, you know, bottles, shampoo bottles, like the whole kit and hoople, if we had like three standard colors, uh, that would significantly improve the economics uh, and the yield, y the yield of recycling tremendously. Uh, you know, the, the color thing, which is a marketing thing, really does a disservice to circularity, just as a starting point. Yeah, that's really interesting, too. If you standardize the colors, then, you know, it would be so much easier to deal with it. 
Um, uh, quite, probably we only have time for one or two more questions, but here's a good one here from Melissa. Can you speak more to the alternatives for fast food um, in terms of packaging? Uh, do you expect to see more food sold in paper or cardboard containers? And what's going to happen if those containers are lined with plastic? Uh, doesn't that make them not recyclable? Uh, so I'm not sure who's maybe maybe uh, <laughs> Ashley, why don't you answer that one? I can start, yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that's gonna be important for the federal government, especially as it lays out its ban list, is also to um, set a framework and some guidance about what accept acceptable substitutions are. Um, especially when we think about uh, some of the compostable paper containers now, there's research coming out that they um, often have a chemical in their lining called PFAS, um, which is a known endocrine disruptor. So we're gonna be careful that we don't see a huge movement towards materials like that um, away from some of the plastics. I think at the end of the day, we're really looking at having them um, ban plastics that we know are harmful to human health or essentially impossible to recycle. So examples of harmful to human health would be things like polystyrene. Um, and if coming back to kind of what Clarissa was saying about pouches, if we set a high collection and recycling target um, and we make sure that all packaging is actually recyclable in the systems that we have, it's possible that we still will have some plastic takeout containers, but we'll know that those containers are actually being effectively recycled and turned into other um, new goods. I think the other other thing that we would like to see um, and probably prioritize is an expansion of those existing reuse systems that I was talking about. So um, in my presentation, I talked about the Latas coffee cup, um, which is the Canadian initiative. You spend a little bit extra, you get a to-go cup, which you then return to um, the cafe when you're done with it. There's examples of that uh, for takeout containers as well. So um, if we had systems in place to allow for the more broad adoption of uh, reuse programs, Programs, then that could also be a really effective alternative to the, dis the disposable single-use plastic packaging we're using these days. Great, yeah. So the key to this is to you know, change the rules so that people aren't introducing novel packaging that can't be recycled, and, and that, of course, needs to be done legislatively. We're really out of time now, unfortunately, because <laughs> lots more questions we could have asked. But uh, just to sum up, Clarissa, maybe for you, uh, you know, and well, for both of you, but Clarissa, maybe you can go first. Like, uh, you know, these are kind of strange times that we're in, you know, um, increases in disposable plastics, you know, industry trying to push back on, on uh, efforts to address this. What keeps you motivated right now when, you know, you sort of feel like you're under attack from a bunch of fronts? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, is, this is in the big scheme of things, a temporary situation. I am extremely motivated by, uh, as you've mentioned earlier, there are attempts by the single-use plastics industry to delay or uh, slow things down. And it's been amazing to see the reaction, not only from, in my particular case, the commission, but also from leading industries that are saying, no, you know what, this is time we get it done. And I think that, uh, you know, in crisis, there's opportunity. And this gives us an opportunity to really move quickly because there's a whole jobs piece to this economic circular economy uh, that, we're, that we maybe should start talking about now and that might push things to go even faster. Um, in terms of the recycling market, the price of oil is down, lower than it's been in uh, decades maybe, and uh, China is no longer taking plastics. So we need legislation, foundational legislation, recycled content, EPR, high monitored third party verified targets now. And if we don't get it now, those recyclers that are currently operating across Canada are going to suffer and a lot of them are going to close. So this is something we need to act on now. There's a great green story and a job story behind it. That's, that's great. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the economic side of this, uh, you know, coming out of this pandemic and moving into recovery mode really shouldn't be overlooked. I think we really uh, need to emphasize that when we're communicating with, uh, with government, that's for sure. Ashley. What uh, keeps you moving? Oh man, so I think, um, yeah, I think that economics piece is important. As I kind of mentioned in one of my slides, it's estimated that if we go to 90% diversion in Canada by 2030, that would get us to 42,000 new jobs. Um, I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, I've also seen some polling recently that suggests that especially um, as people are spending more time at home and actually uh, making a lot more of their own meals, they're becoming more attuned to how much plastic is used in packaging. Um, and it's actually motivated them to care more about the environment. 
Um, I've also seen a lot of conversations about, you know, people thinking more about where they're putting their money in this context as we think about supporting small local businesses. And I think that small local businesses um, often have an opportunity to be champions of, um, you know, different, different methods of giving us the same stuff. So things like those reusable platforms, et cetera. Um, so I agree with Clarissa. I think that this is a hard time for sure, but I think that it's temporary and there is so much momentum behind uh, the fight against plastic pollution. And I actually think that we're at, an, we're at a point where we can use um, this crisis to kind of help advance uh, our efforts to have a sustainable future. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks to you both. Um, we're going to wrap up now. Um, we have more questions we didn't get to, of course, um, which is great. Uh, we're going to be doing a blog that, that comes out of the discussion that we had here today. And we have those questions and we're going to try and address them in the blog. So you'll see that there and we'll make sure that we send it around. Um, I want to really thank, uh, take a moment here actually to thank uh, all of you who are environmental defense supporters uh, for joining us today. It's really encouraging to see so many of you here and also taking action. You know, when we uh, send out information, uh, we need you to contact MPs or MPPs about important decisions about addressing plastic waste. It makes a huge difference when our elected officials hear from you and we just really want to have a shout out uh, to you for, for doing that. Um, we, uh, what's next here? Um, sorry, my screen is a little bit confused here. So we know that right now uh, we are going to have this challenge where there's going to be a lot of people saying that we need plastics more than ever. Um, we know that that's not true. We know that we need to build on momentum. So if you could uh, go online and share our petition with your friends and family about telling the federal government to proceed with the commitments they've made, you can uh, visit that at environmentaldefense.ca uh, slash ncanadianplasticpollution. So if you go there, uh, you'll be able to find that and um, you know share it around with people that you know and send it if you have it yourself. And uh, we'll be uh, sending a follow-up email next week as well with a link to the petition. If you don't have time to go and look for it, we'll make sure that you actually see it. Um, so next week, we're having the next in our series, our recovery series. Uh, that time we're going to be discussing the missing link in pollution, health, and COVID-19. And that's going to include our toxics program manager, Mohanad Malas, and Dr. Bruce Lanfear, who's a health science professor at Simon Fraser University. And they're really going to dig into this issue of, about how pollution actually makes us more susceptible to things like this virus. And that's going to be really fascinating. And we're going to talk about where to next in terms of addressing pollution that makes us more susceptible to these diseases. Um, so please keep in touch with us. Um, you can follow Environmental Defense on Twitter and Facebook or reach out to us uh, on email. So thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you all here next week. See you later. <laughs>